So my name is Akhil Sharma. It's um, very nice to be here. I'm going to, you know, the, the reason I don't know what the reviews say is I, just, I try not to read them. Um, and there are two reasons. One, one basically, the, I only really notice the negativeness. You know, so if there's one line where somebody says something minor, that's what I'll hold on to and hug. Uh, somehow believing that abuse is reveals more truth than uh, love. You know, I, uh, I'll keep working on that. Um, and then the other thing that I'm afraid of is that if I read praise, I might begin believing it, uh, and I'm afraid that it might it might throw off my instincts. You know, I might begin trying to work to aim for praise instead of aiming for what I think of as good. The the novel that I've written, um, Family Life, is based very closely on my own story, the, the story of my parents who came to America in 79. Um, there was me, my brother, and my older brother, and then two years after we came, my brother had an accident in a swimming pool. He died, he struck his head on the bottom of the pool, and he lay stunned there for about three minutes, and the oxygen deprivation caused severe brain damage. Uh, I mean, he, after the, afterwards he wasn't able to walk or talk, he couldn't even roll over in his sleep. Uh, he remained in a hospital for two years and then my parents brought him home and began taking care of him themselves. And, you know, they did this for various reasons. You know, one is, of course, they felt that they could take better care of him than, than the hospital could. Because, you know, in hospitals, you're just somebody, you're just a body. Uh, and partially also because they loved him so much. You know, we, it wasn't just that, uh, that they loved, that they thought they could take better care of him. They just loved him so much that they didn't know how to show their love, you know? And so they want more opportunities to love him than they were allowed in the hospital. You know, we often think we love people, but we don't know how much we love them. The problem was that when they brought him home, it caused the, it was enormous, enormous pressure and caused the family to collapse. So I, I wrote this novel, and um, I wrote it as a novel instead of a memoir because, you know, because I'm a fiction writer and I know how to use the tools of fiction. I know how to use dialogue. I know how to collapse time, I know how to you know, move people in and out of scenes, whereas nonfiction is, you know, you actually have to be true. You know, you can't just make shit up. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, I wouldn't be able to use dialogue because I couldn't claim credibly that, um, that it was, that I could remember what had happened. I also found, um, I believe that for me, uh, nonfiction has to have an element of sort of objective reality, that I have to talk about the things that were important, but which were not, which I don't find interesting. Like for example, for me, much of my childhood was full of boredom. And I have just no desire to write about boredom. <laughs> so when I was writing this book, part of what was motivating me was memorializing my parents' lives and my life and my brother. I was afraid, you know, we're ordinary people. My family is an ordinary family. And, you know, ordinary people get forgotten. And so there were many times when I could have picked a detail which was um, from fiction, I could have picked a detail from life. And I would choose to take a detail from life just because I wanted to preserve things, you know, I wanted to hold on to things. So it was very hard to write this book. It took 12 and a half years. And frankly, if I, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> uh, you know, not all decisions are smart decisions, even if you get good results. Um, I found it hard to write the book because of various things. One was it was hard to, to have a steady viewpoint on my family. Like some days I would remember back and I would feel incredibly hurt and incredibly angry. And some days I would remember, and I would just feel tenderness for my parents and how their pain, their torment twisted them, you know, made them crazy. So it's hard to hold a, a steady viewpoint, the sort of viewpoint that you need for fiction to sustain a voice. 
I also found it technically very difficult to write this book, just for various reasons, um, such as how to control the point of view of a child, or how to control uh, a narrative where the plot is very, uh, very minor, you know, where it's mostly the weight of events. One of the things that I discovered, and something that has always been natural to me, is sort of finding humor in things. I have a hard time not finding absurdity. <coughs> The, because we're all fun people, you know, we're, we're very odd people. Uh, I know that I'm a strange guy. <laughs> so I'm gonna, the, the book has two beginnings and two endings, uh, partially for various technical reasons and partially because I feel that the truth of an incident like this can only be represented uh, by showing how the, the repercussions go on and on and on that there isn't a symmetrical ending, a formal ending to a story like this. Uh, so this is the, the start of the second beginning. As far back as I can remember, my parents have bothered each other. You, know, you always want to begin something with a fight. <laughs> People love fights, you know, they just love them. Um, so as far back as I can remember, my parents have bothered each other. In India, we lived in two concrete rooms on the roof of a house. The bathroom stood separate from the living quarters. The sink was attached to one of the exterior walls. Each night, my father would stand before the sink, the sky above him full of stars, and brush his teeth until his gums bled. Then he would spit the blood into the sink and turn to my mother and say, Death, Shubha, death. No matter what we do, we will all die. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the thing is, you make a promise of a fight so that the audience becomes interested. And then you begin building up the visual world so that there's a reason, so it becomes easier for the reader to invest. So you bring the reader in, and then it allows you, once the reader is inside, it allows you to then begin doing weird things, such as having a character who does some, who says things like, death, shubha, death, no matter what we do, we will all die. Uh, so then the, uh, the next paragraph. Yes, yes, beat drums, my mother said once. Tell the newspapers too. Make sure everyone knows this thing you have discovered. <laughs> like many people of her generation, those born before independence, my mother viewed gloom as unpatriotic. <coughs> to complain was to show that you were not willing to accept difficulties, that you were not willing to do the hard work that was needed to build the country. My father was only two years older than my mother. Unlike her, he saw dishonesty and selfishness everywhere. Not only did he see these things, but he believed that everybody else did too and that people were deliberately not acknowledging what they saw. My mother's irritation at his spitting blood, he interpreted as hypocrisy. One of the stylistic, um, one of my fingerprints, uh, if you will, is that I tend to combine sort of lovely things with sort of gross things. You know, um, it's hard for me to not see that these things exist next to each other. So. You know, I often have sentences like, uh, each night my father would stand before the sink, the sky above him full of stars, and brush his teeth until his gums split. Like, it seems hard for me to not have that dynamic, that lovely things are next to gross things. You know, it, it just seems to me natural. Or to have a gross thing next to something beautiful. The other thing that I find, um, when I look at my own work and what I'm looking to see whether it's working, is whether all the, pe all the characters are right and all of the characters are wrong, simultaneously wrong. So, you know, the father is a bit crazy, you know, in, in that he sees selfishness everywhere. And yet, if you live in India, you know, that might actually be a reasonable perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that, you know, the mother wants to see goodness. And to me, that's a very mentally healthy thing, you know, to try to see the goodness in people. And yet, simultaneously, she's forcing herself to see goodness. She's choosing, uh, it's almost a matter of status for her to not see uh, reality for reality. So th that's one of the things that I'm always sort of seeking out. So my mother's irritation at his spitting blood, he interpreted as hypocrisy. My father was an accountant. He had wanted to immigrate to the West ever since he was in his early 20s ever since America liberalized its immigration policies in 1965. His wish rose out of self-loathing. 
Often when he walked down the street in Delhi, he would feel that the buildings he passed were indifferent to him, that he mattered so little to them that he might as well, have not, might as, might as well not have been born. Because he attributed this feeling to his circumstances and not to the fact that he was the sort of person who sensed buildings having opinions about him, <laughs> he believed that if he were somewhere else, especially somewhere where he was paid in dollars and thus was rich, he would be a different person and one whose life had meaning. Another reason he wanted to emigrate was that he saw the West as glamorous with the excitement of science. In India, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, radios, televisions, and cars were not just expensive objects, but seen as almost supernatural. I remember that when we turned on the radio in our apartment, as soon as the vacuum tubes warmed up, first the voices would sound far away, and then they would rush at us. And this was thrilling, as if the machine were making some special effort for us. Of everybody in my family, my father loved science the most. He tried to bring it into his life by going to medical clinics and having his urine tested. <laughs> he loved clinics and doctor's offices. Of course, hypochondria had something to do with this. My father suspected that there was something wrong with him and that it might be something physical. Also, sitting in the clinics and talking to doctors in lab coats, he felt that he was close to important things, that what the doctors were doing was the same as what doctors would do in England or Germany or America, that he was already there in those, in those foreign countries. My mother had no interest in emigrating for herself. She was a high school economics teacher and she liked her job, but she thought that the West would provide me and my brother Virgil with opportunities. Then came the emergency. Indira Gandhi suspended the constitution and put thousands of politicians and journalists in jail. My parents, like almost everyone who had seen independence come, were very loyal. They were the sort of people who looked up at a cloud and thought, that's an Indian cloud. Mm -hmm. After the emergency, however, they began to think that even though they were ordinary and unlikely to get into political trouble, it might still be better to emigrate. One difference between this novel and my first one is that the characters are much more appealing. They have a certain tenderness to them. Because the, the characters in, in my previous book had characters that um, were reprehensible. And so we were always trying to figure out a way to get away from them. Because of that, I had to use a lot of scenes. Because you know, dra dramatic scenes have a visceral reality that's hard to escape. The, in this story, because the characters are much more tender and appealing, I can use a lot more exposition. You know, because I don't need to hold on to my reader. I don't need to grip my reader as much as I did in my first novel. The, uh, the problem with exposition is that it begins to feel very boring very quickly. And so you have to keep shifting gears. You know, so, and one of the, or you have to keep providing energy. Uh, so you know, the opening of this section is the character, you know, the, the narrator talking about the father as a, um, you know, him having opinions about Bill, him thinking that buildings have opinions about him. So you want to put in a joke because you want humor, and then you need to vary the energy. You know, you can't just have one type of energy in a story. And so then the next paragraph has the, this sort of uh, anthropological details about how technology was viewed, but you don't want pure anthropology either. And so you convert it into a little bit of poetry by describing how the song would rush at, rush at you. And so these are all the things that you need to do keep to, to vary the tone, but to not vary it too much when you're working with exposition. Um, and then switching back to humor with the urine test. And then the last two paragraphs, which are contain a lot of the, the plot, what would, what would normally you would want to dramatize, are presented very quickly. The sentence about the mother's the immigration uh, is uh, two sentences. And then, sort of the you know the world that they were leaving, the emergency again is only two or three sentences. So the the logic is very different when you're working with these type of characters versus the ones that we had uh, that I had to deal with in my first book. Uh, so I'll read just a little bit more. Uh, I used to assume that my father had been assigned to us by the government. This was because he appeared to serve no purpose. <laughs> When he got home in the evening, all he did was sit in his chair in the living room, drink tea, and read the paper. Often, he looked angry. By the time we left for, by the time we left for America, when I was eight and Bridget was twelve, I knew that the government had not assigned him to live with us. Still, I continued to think that he served no purpose. 
My father, who had gone to America a year, a year before us, was waiting for us in the arrivals hall at the airport. He was leaning against a metal railing and looking irritated. The sight of him made me anxious. The apartment he had rented was in a tall brown brick, brown brick building in Queens. The gray metal front door swung open into a foyer with a wooden floor. Beyond this was a living room with a, a, living room with a reddish brown carpet that went from wall to wall. I had never seen a carpet except in movies. Bridget and my parents walked across the foyer and into the living room. I went to the carpet's edge and stopped. A brass grip held the carpet to the floor. I took a step forward, trying not to put my weight down. I felt as if I were stepping onto a painting. Mm -hmm. My father took us to the bathroom to show us toilet paper and hot water. Whereas my mother was interested in status, in being better educated than others or being considered more respectable, my father was simply interested in having more things. I think this was because while both of my parents had grown up poor, my father's childhood had been much more desperate. At some point, my father's father had begun to believe that thorns were growing out of his palms. He had taken a razor and picked at his hands until they were shaggy with scraps of skin. Because of my grandfather's problems, my father had grown up feeling that no matter what he did, people would look down on him. As a result, he cared less about trying to convince people of his merits and more about just possessing things. The bathroom was narrow. It had a tub, a sink, and a toilet in a row along one wall. My father reached between Bridget and me and turned on the tap. Hot water came shaking and steaming to the basin. He stepped back and looked at us to gauge our reaction. I had never seen hot water coming from a tap before. In India, in the winter, my mother used to get up early to heat pots of water on the stove so that we could bathe. Watching the hot water spill out as if there were an endless supply, I had the sense of being in a fairy tale, one of those, one of those stories with a jug that is always full of milk or a bag that never empties, or a bag of food that never empties. That night, I went to bed on a mattress in the living room. The apartment had one bedroom where my parents slept. Even in my sleep, I was aware that I was in America. As the days passed, the wealth of this new country continued to astonish me. There were programs on television from morning till night. In our shiny brass mailbox in the lobby, we received ads on colored paper. The sliding glass doors of our apartment building would open when we approached. Each time they did this, I felt that we had been mistaken for somebody important. <laughs> My father, who had seemed pointless in India, had brought us to America, and now we were rich. The fact that he had achieved this made him seem different, mysterious. All the time now, he was saying things that revealed him as knowledgeable. In India, my mother had been the one who made the decisions concerning Virgil and me. Now I realized that my father too had opinions about us. This felt both surprising and intrusive, like being touched by a relative you don't know well. My father took Virgil and me to a library. I had been in two, li two libraries before then, one in a small noisy room next to a barber shop, it had newspapers but not books, and had been used primarily by people searching the employment ads. The other had been on the second floor of a temple, and it had, and it had, had books, but they were kept locked in glass-fronted cabinets. The library in Queens was bigger than either of the ones I had seen. It had several rooms and thousands of books. The librarian said that we could check out as many as we wanted. I did not believe this at first. My father told Virgil and me that he would give us 50 cents for each book we read. This bribing struck me as un-Indian and wrong. My mother had told us that Americans were afraid to demand things from their children. She'd said that, that this was because American parents did not care about their children and, uh, and were unwilling to do the hard work of disciplining them. If my father wanted us to read, what he should have done was threaten to beat us. <laughs> I wondered whether my father had become too American during the years that he had lived alone. I wanted to check out 10 picture books. My father said, you think I'm gonna give you money for such small books? <laughs> uh, I'm going to read only two more paragraphs. This is the start of a new section. My mother, Bridget, and I had taken everything we could from the airplane. Red Air India blankets, pillows with paper pillowcases, headsets, sachets of ketchup, packets of salt and pepper, air sickness bags. Bridget and I used the blankets until they freed and tore. Around that time, we started going to school. I had a shy nature. You were a tiger at home, my mother said, and a cat outside. At school, I sat at the very back of the class in the row closest to the door. Often I could not understand what my teacher was saying. I had studied English in India, but either my teacher spoke too quickly and used words I did not know, or else I was so afraid that her words sounded garbled to my ears. The reason I wanted to read these last two paragraphs is, um, you know, a part of me wants to memorialize not just my family, but my community. You know, I'm, I'm pleased by being Indian, you know? 
it pleases me to belong to this group. Um, and I'm pleased by being an immigrant, and I'm pleased by having this bit of history. But this bit of history is going to get lost, you know? Because again, it's not the, it's not the sort of thing that is protected or um, memorialized. And by capturing how we used to behave, we first Indians to America, you know, when we came on airplanes, we would just basically take everything, everything. We would bring it home and, you know, like for months afterwards, you would find all sorts of, you know, salt and pepper or mixture <laughs> packets everywhere. Um, and that, so I wanted to, I mean, I could have put in another detail, but I wanted, I wanted to hold on to that. Um, and the other thing that's slightly different uh, between this book and my earlier book is that the transitions between paragraphs are not as tight. Uh, in my first book, just because I knew that the reader would be resisting me, would not want to remain with me, uh, the idea was to create something compulsive so that if you began, uh, when you finished a paragraph, you had to go to the next one. But here, you could have, uh, around that time, we started going to school, and then the next paragraph is, I had a shy nature. And the logic is not as clear, you know, as to what the link between the two paragraphs. But because we are okay with these characters, we are more willing to just go along. Uh, and that's something else that I found very interesting as I was working on this book. Anyway, thank you for letting me share this with you. Uh, you know, as somebody who spent 12 and a half years writing on this, I feel obligated to point out all the little things that I did. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So, I have to ask you, I was reading along in your book and finding many diversions and digressions from the book in what you just read. So can you explain that? Why, why was that a slightly different text? And mm -hmm. say something about the differences and why the final version ended up the, like these small variations. There's, um, what I was reading was the excerpt in the New Yorker. And the, my, opinion about what uh, a short story requires versus what a novel requires is that a short story, just because it is shorter, needs a slightly higher level of polish to appear a work of art. Whereas a novel, because we're going to be with these characters for such a long time, it can, you can, you can, the, the work can generate the feeling of artfulness if it is wounded um, and scarred, or if it has certain things which are not, which which in a traditional work of art you would not have. So, for example, in the New Yorker excerpt, I do not have, I don't repeat words from paragraph to paragraph. So, if one paragraph has contained. I don't, in the next paragraph, use the word contain. Uh, because I feel that in a shorter work, I needed to have a greater degree of polish. In a longer work, I actually want it to be more lifelike, more like human beings speak. So that's one motivation. There are other sort of technical changes that I made. Like in the novel, uh, there is uh, there's a moment when we jump forward in time and then jump backwards in time. And the logic of that is that I want the reader to be reminded by that jump that of the overall structure of the book, that the book begins uh, 20 or 25 years in the future, and that this is um, a recollection. And so, sir, so that thing, that device is needed in the novel where it is not necessary in the short story. You could have begun in a more classic Buildings Roman way with the early life of the narrator. Could it be done with the accent, the most dramatic thing? You begin with this two-part beginning about the parents, and then we're in India. We're in India at the moment when the family is getting ready to go to America, which is the first big event. So what? Why? Why did you begin that way? Um, the, so the, the, question, the book begins with um, the, this young, this man who's about, who's 40, um, talking about his father. The 
and we have like three or four paragraphs, and then we jump to where I began reading. So the question is, why why that structure? Uh, you know, I I wrote uh, seven thousand pages, you know, uh, out of which these two hundred pages remain uh, a horror, really. <laughs> I say that I wish I had not written this book. I mean it. Uh, and so I've tried almost every structure. Uh, for me, the benefit of having, beginning with this 40-year-old, uh, is that it then allows, when we go into the recounting, into the point of view of Ajay as a child, there isn't that same pressure of trying to mimic the voice of a child. So the sentence structures can be a little bit more complicated, and the diction can be a little bit more complicated. That's one reason. So you were following in Joyce's name and thinking in terms of developing the, the diction as the character develops with the maturing and, and sentence structure too. So. I, I thought, you know, I, um, I spent a lot of time reading Poker of the Artist and uh, I realized it, that is not something that interests me. Um, I just want enough freedom to, uh, so that the reader isn't bothered by the fact that it is a child. That is theoretically the point of view of a child. So I wanted to build an excuse within the narrative that would justify it. So that was one reasoning. The other reasoning was that if we begin with an, our knowledge of this person as a 40 year old, to some extent the sting and the pain of what occurs in the novel is diminished. Because we have a sense that, okay, things are going to be okay, he's going to get out of this thing. And so it, that means that you can then really pull on the pain. You know, you can really make things uh, bad because it won't hurt as much. So that was another bit of reasoning. So in the in the classic development of the novels, this would have been your first novel, and you would have then been able to move on to all the other things you wanted to write about, having gotten this enormous bullet out of the way. Um, but you didn't make this your first novel, maybe because you had a premonition that it would take you 12 and a half years. <laughs> Why, why was your first novel, in a, in a way, more like a novel by someone older, I would say, someone who isn't looking inward and backward, but is trying to write about an entire society, uh, India, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the inner and outer corruption that's the theme of that book? Uh, I, I think that both of my novels are at least emotionally autobiographical. You know, the first novel is about this man who's a child molester and his guilt, and about the torture around him, the torment around him. And to me, this the guilt is the guilt that I felt at being okay. You know, at my brother not being okay and me being okay. And, and I needed to create within the fictional world some reason to justify that guilt. Because I knew that intellectually, I understood that there was no reason to feel such guilt. So that was one. So th both of those books are autobiographical. Uh, it was just a, how do I convert uh, that pain into a fictional reality? The but why didn't you take it head on when you first sat down as a young writer to write a novel? <coughs> the I think it. What I thought then was that I needed to, that part of, part of, I was very ambitious, and I am very ambitious, and I thought that part of signaling to the world how good I am was uh, writing a book that went and did all these different things, you know, and uh, to show that I can walk through all these different routes and I can do all these different things. So I think that was a lot of the motivation behind it. Um, I do think the other the thing that if I had tried to write this book when I was like to me this book is full of tenderness to me you know the second book and I think if I I don't think I had that level of sort of compassion and tenderness when I was younger I think I felt um, so bruised so hurt that I don't know if I would have been able to. Um, bring that level of empathy to all of these characters. Uh, and being who I was, I needed uh, a very strong plot to hold me 
so that the energy I felt, the hurt I felt, could run through these channels. So do you think, I don't want to poke me into 12 and a half years, but you brought it up, and it's, it's, it's a salient fact about this book, and I think a really important one. Do you think part of the 12 and a half years was not just the technical problems, but the problem of empathy and of understanding and of acceptance that the book ends with, that I think saturates the book, but that you might not even think it would arrive at in the start? I think that's the case, that I'm, um, you know, I'm a different person now, or it, I became a different person through the writing of the book, over the years of writing the book. I don't necessarily think that it was writing the book that made me more empathetic. <coughs> I think it was simply, at a certain point, deciding that, you know, life is short, and I would rather be happy than unhappy. And it's easier to be happy if I offer compassion and understanding than it is if I'm full of anger, or if I want to hold everyone accountable. You know, my parents didn't do the best they could, right? They didn't do the best that they knew how. You know, all that happened was they gave me what they had. You know, they had anger, so they gave me anger. They had fear, so they gave me fear. Uh, and it took a long time to say, okay, so that's what it is. And to realize that that's the case for me too, you know that um, I give what I have. You know I don't, I can't give anything other than that. You wrote an op-ed about this a few days ago, uh, a really striking one that seemed to see us this the secret of finishing the book mm -hmm. was this shift in <coughs> your own happiness and unhappiness and its relation with people around. You know, at least that that's what I. You didn't say that directly, I don't think. You didn't say, and then I finished the book. Yeah. But you did finish the book after that crisis. I, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times about how, at a certain point, I began praying a lot. I, every time I say that, I feel like I need to make an excuse. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I personally don't believe in God or anything else like that, but I do pray regularly, uh, all the time. And so what I mostly do is this exercise that I learned from Reader's Digest. <laughs> which is, you know, if you want happiness, you should pray for other people. You know, that you should uh, wish them good health, that you should wish them peace of mind, you know. And what I found was, doing that, I was taken out of myself. That it allowed me to think about somebody other than me. And I feel that it had an effect on the style of my writing. And that the solutions that became accessible to me informed this book. But between my starting to pray and the book ending was five and a half years. So it wasn't as if, you know, the praying led to it. Uh, the praying was part and parcel. But who knows, you know, if I had just remained bitter and angry for another five and a half years, I would have come up with a, a different set of solutions. Mm -hmm. And those 5,000 words? 7,000 words? Pages. Not I mean, words. I think it's <laughs> the words as a magazine writer. Pages. It's a, it's a pretty daunting number. So horrible, man. It's so horrible. <laughs> I have three hard drives filled with um, So tell us a little about what you left behind in order to get to, to this. What did you have to? The narrative used to be in third person instead of first. The problem with third person is that third person narratives consume plot at a different rate than first person. Okay, that was one thing. Um, the, you mean they're slow? The third person narrative. In fiction, the only thing that really matters, the only stake that really matters is the character at risk. If you have uh, an I narrative, a first person narrative, almost anything becomes important. I see this, I experience this, you know, I become a little bit afraid. Whereas in a third person narrative, he became a little bit afraid, he saw this. We soon begin to want things of greater import to occur. And so the plot has to be has to be more combustible. Um, so, so from third person I went to first, that would be one thing. I also, at a certain point, wasn't able to figure out how to get this diction uh, and sentence structure to work. So I wrote at least one draft, maybe two drafts from the point of view of the mother. Then I wrote at least one or two drafts from the point of view of the father. Uh, it's a good thing it was a small family. <laughs> um, I had, even after the book was handed in, 
And right before it went to gal into galleys, there was a chapter which, is, which was about the father's alcoholism, another chapter. And I took that out. And there used to be maybe 600 pages. At least I wrote about 600 pages about the father's alcoholism. And now it's uh, much less. <laughs> <laughs> so all these different things. You know, the, the narrator discovers Hemingway at a relatively early age, and apprentices himself to Hemingway, reads Hemingway, and then reads essays about Hemingway to try to learn how to write, and begins to write. And it's a wonderful portrait of the artist as a young man. So did, did Hemingway do anything in your post style? Because you had this incredibly lucid, terse, I don't think any sentence is longer than two or three lines. Um, and the sentence structure doesn't vary a lot. Uh, it's short decorative prose, um, which I think comes out of, is, is a phrase out of what he reads about it. So tell us a little about how your prose style, as someone who, did, who didn't grow up you know, with English as a first language, how did your prose style emerge? You know, I grew up, um, in my family, um, largely I was ignored, and when I was not ignored, it was even worse. Uh, and I began to want attention. And as a little boy, when I was in junior high school and high school, I used to lie all the time about books I had read. Uh, I would say I had read this thing, but I had never, no idea who this person was. <laughs> Boldly lying. And uh, at one point, I I read a biography of Hemingway, and I realized that this guy had gotten to travel all around the world and have a good life without being a doctor or an engineer, which is the fate I had assumed would happen to me. <laughs> and so I read this thing, and I thought, you know, maybe I too can be a writer and lead a glamorous life. <laughs> so I went and began to, I had never read a word of Hemingway. So I went and I read, uh, began reading all this criticism of Hemingway. Because I just wanted to learn how to write. I didn't really care about Hemingway. I didn't really care about books or fiction. All I wanted was to be a writer. And so I read all of this criticism, and then I began reading Hemingway. And I, you know, at first I found it unbelievably tedious. Uh, but to make myself pay attention, I would, you know, I would write down the number of words in a sentence. I would uh, read things backwards you know, read a, a book backwards, you know. And I still do that. Like, I remember reading, a, at some point, reading a Tolstoy's childhood backwards, you know, just to make myself focus on sentences. The Hemingway, I can't even tell how important he is to me, because he was such a large part of my origin. And at a certain point, I realized that in Hemingway, all of his characters have to be good. Because if you are writing so plainly about you know people who behave badly, then those come off as psychopaths. I, you know, the world that I grew up in, mostly people did not behave well, and so I realized that I could not write plainly, and so my style had to become more complicated, uh, and I had to begin to do things that Hemingway does not do, but everything comes out of him, and the, the narrator also sort of sees through him. Mm -hmm. and sees what's false in any way. And one thing that strikes me about your narrator's early efforts is, okay, he approaches it wanting to be a writer, which leads you to think it might have a lot of affectation mm -hmm. and distance from his own life. You might write about boxers in the 30s, mm -hmm. you know, riding rails in the mm -hmm. West. Instead, he has, he's writing about what is right there, and he's writing about it with you know, that lacerating, Honesty that I think is a hallmark of your work. So, connect it to yourself and tell us how you. It seems that you must have used writing to to report the truth, even though lots of young writers use writing to get away from the truth, get away from their own life. Um, you know, there's um there's a moment in the in in the novel where this character begins writing. And uh, he hears his brother coughing, and it wakes him. And so he begins to write down, tries to write a short story. And there's a Hemingway story about a man watching another man die. And um, 
I, I wrote a, I remember waking up listening to my brother cough one night and deciding to write a story and thinking, oh, I can't write it about my brother because it's not relatable. Or I need something which is simpler. And so writing from the, writing about a man listening to his, uh, the coughing of his sick wife. And the, what I put in is what I wrote when I was in high school. And about, a, about this man listening to his sick wife cough. And at some point, the character and what I did was thinking, oh, I need to end this thing. So what, how do I end it? And the way I ended it is by, by thinking of, okay, at one, some point this person is gonna die. And then thinking about my brother dying and immediately not wanting him gone. You know, wanting to remain even if he were sick. And writing, oh, you know, lucky are the people with sick wives. Lucky are, like after my brother died, my brother died two years ago, and I would have been happy for him to come back. You know, I would have been happy to keep him there sick. Uh, because I just couldn't bear the loss of him. To me, you know, I try to write with honesty because I assume that you can see through me. You know, that if I tell a lie, you will know the lie. You know, it's hard for me to believe that, that the people around me can't see through me. And so if that is the case, let me be as transparent as possible. Do you think of your work as being without putting it in, in, a, in a niche? Immigrant literature in the sense that, first of all, it's literature by someone who learn English later. Second, uh, the subject of this book is this incredible story that you describe of that generation of Indians who came in the late 70s. And also something about the, the guilt and the anger uh, reminds me of some earlier immigrant American writers. Do you think of yourself in that in that tradition? You know, I mean, I I mean, I think of Henry James as an immigrant writer, <laughs> because he's writing the ambassadors. Uh, you know, or much of Hemingway as writing about you know these guys immigrating abroad. The I, I don't, when I was younger, I resisted that term because I felt, oh, you know, I should be seen as a writer. And now I think, you know, I am a writer. And what is valuable in a writer is, you know, telling, telling the, tr the things that remain true. You know, the things that I write about, they were true 100 years ago and they're gonna be true 100 years from now. The, and my approach now to labels like this, uh, they are two. One, I feel a lot, you know, I want this book to, I view this book as having, as its goal, one, one of its goals is sort of memorializing this community and memorializing uh, my family. And so to some extent, I don't really care as much about labels as I did with my first one. But the, another thing is, you know, as you get older, you begin to realize you're always going to have to deal with idiots. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, how much energy can you devote trying to convince an idiot that he's an idiot? You know, it's just best to go around the idiot. Uh, and so, you know, sure, I'm an immigrant novelist, I'm a male novelist, you know, I'm an investment banking novelist. You know, you can, you can chop and dice these things uh, in any, way, any number of ways. Uh, in the end, the, the only thing that matters is once you begin the book, uh, what is its effect on you? Have your parents read the book? Thank God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why have they not read it? Yeah. Um, my mother, when I told her I was going to write this thing, said, Akhil, just make me look good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then my father, when I told him I was writing this book, said, and I, once the gallery was done I, done, I asked him if he wanted to read it. And he said, why? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> And my mother actually has, she was very excited uh, when she began to see the reviews. Like, she loves attention as well. Um, <laughs> and then she Googled me for the first time. And she realized that in some article I had written, I had mentioned that when, we were, when I was young, then we would go out to Pizza Hut. We would um, only, uh, when we ordered soda, we would have the ice in a separate glass, because why waste volume with ice? You want only soda. And uh, this really hurt her feelings and made her feel, you know, it made her feel bad. 
And so I'm just, you know, I imagine her reading this book. <laughs> so I hope she does not read it. <laughs> and you're sure they haven't read it. Oh, I'm certain they haven't read it. You know that if it's, um, you know, they haven't read the first one. <laughs> you know, so I'm pretty certain the first one isn't about them. Yeah, I don't think they're interested, you know. Uh, uh -oh. okay. <laughs> We'll talk again in a month. Okay. I'm going to let the audience ask you some questions now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Would you talk a little bit about the editorial process? Like, did your editor at Norton read those early drafts? And once you delivered the manuscript, were you asked to make more changes? Or was it smooth sailing after that? You know, it's hard for an editor to really help you when what you've written is Drek. Uh, and so periodically, I would send her a draft or a section of the manuscript, and she would reply after a long while, saying, oh, Akhil, okay, it's so wonderful to see how hard you are, how hardworking you are, etc. And several, several paragraphs of really fulsome praise, and then saying, this is terrible. What are you thinking? Are you mad? And, uh, so, one, but once the book was done, then we could have, I mean, the most valuable thing that my wonderful, wonderful editor did was protect me during those, I, this book was nine years overdue. Uh, so protect me from getting my contract canceled. Uh, each year on the um, anniversary of the due date, she would email me and ask me to lunch. Uh, and. I would usually feel such shame and fear I wouldn't reply. <laughs> and then she would email my agent, who would email me. Uh, so the most valuable thing for a long time was her just protecting me and encouraging me and showing me that she was there. And then once the manuscript was handed in, she had changes, but they weren't major changes, you know, because at a certain point, once the book is alive, whatever is wrong can be fixed pretty easily. Uh, so she was, she was, she was astonishingly, helpful, astonishingly helpful. I mean, I can't imagine the book. I can't imagine the book. I think there are probably only two houses. I think FSG and Norton are probably the only two houses where a writer could be such a screw up and still uh, last, still not be canceled. So she was incredibly useful in that sense. And then she was useful at the way that a traditional editor is as well. Um, but considering the monumental help of her protecting me, the editorial help is significant, but uh, minor compared to, the, to that other help. <coughs> so you say you're very ambitious. Uh, that exactly what that uh, you're writing in very honest fields that may not always be a path to success or uh, to conditions uh, realized. Uh, if the conditions are about to be uh, commercially successful, uh, if you know. So the question is, what is ambition? What does ambition mean for me? You know, Lincoln said that he didn't want people's admiration. He wanted to be deserving of admiration. Uh, and that's sort of what, it, what, it, what I would like. You know, I don't really care you know, what the general audience thinks of me. You know, the general audience, who knows? You know, they're crazy. You know, they watch, you know, wrestling. You know, for, um, for me, the audience that matters is other writers. Uh, that's the audience that I aim for. You, you talked to, uh, already about, um, a little bit about the difference between the story and the novel. I read the story, but I haven't read the novel yet. I'm just wondering, what was the hardest part about figuring out what was going to get excerpted and what you had to do? Uh, you know, the, um, this book has been excerpted a lot. Um, and so when you're excerpting, what you aim for is, you know, you want to, want to, want to create something that will stand alone as a story. So you want to find something that's a compelling beginning, and you want to figure out a way to get to a compelling end, and be interesting all the way through. 
So there's another section which I excerpted, or another magazine. Uh, so this thing was excerpted three times, one twice for the New Yorker and once for a magazine called Vice. And so I just looked to see what would be, what would stand alone. Yeah, one of the central elements of fiction is trying to enter the mindset of the person instead of looking at them from a distance. And it, especially as, a, as perhaps someone coming to America, right, as an immigrant author, there is that throughout all the history, humans have been confronted by reality in very harsh ways. By, uh, by, the, by you know, they imagine things and reality confronts them, and dominates it. And then you come to America. And there's infinite possibilities, actually. And it transforms the reality, right? You finally come to they can do whatever they want. And then um, your brother, right, hits the bottom of the pool and is right, brain dead. So can you talk about the struggle between fiction and reality that emerged, perhaps for you especially, once you started to pray, that opened up your capacity to empathize? And fiction, as recent studies show, allows us to empathize. So uh, the, I guess there, your question is, your, you have several questions. You know, one is the difference between fiction and non-fiction. Um, you know, what gets left in, in fiction, what gets left out. That's first, the first question. The, for me, the, uh, the, when I begin, when I, when I revise, I don't really revise, I open up a blank document and begin writing again. Uh, and for me, the reasoning behind it is that if I can't remember it, then it probably doesn't need to be there. <laughs> and so what is, what is included in fiction is what is the thing that cannot be forgotten. So that would be sort of just the difference in details between uh, fiction and non-fiction. Uh, so in non-fiction, you, there's a compulsion to include important things, and sometimes, I mean, depending on the sort of fiction you're not fiction you're writing, like you know, if you read uh, much of Robert Caro's stuff, you know, a lot of that thing, I, a lot of those books, you know, you know, I read three volumes of the LBJ, and I read the Power Broker, and um, frankly, a lot of that stuff could have been skipped, and uh, you know, many times I'm reading that book, and I think, you know, do I really need to read this thing? Do I really need a footnote on how he handled the Hispanic vote in this little district? You know, uh, there might be some value in it. You know, I'm I'm not. That's not a, an area that I really know. In fiction, that is, there is no value in it. Okay, so that would be one way. And then the question you had about empathy. Uh, look, I have tremendous empathy for my parents. I just have more empathy for myself. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, hey, look, I know your life was tough, I would say, with my, my parents, but look, that doesn't mean you go around kicking me. Uh, and the, for me, the difference you asked about prayer and how it affected me was that it gave me a little di distance between, m between what happened to me and me as a writer. You know, I could see things, and I could see, hey, people behaved in a really crappy and, and immature way but I am able to still be generous towards them. 